You must be willing to tell the doctor what's wrong if you want the doctor to make it right. You and I must be willing to tell God what's wrong with our attitudes, our actions, what we did, what we said that would block fellowship with him if we want to hear from heaven. In Isaiah 58, the prophet talks to the children of Israel and he speaks to us today about how to sharpen your spiritual acts to get more accomplished. It is the single longest passage in Scripture on fasting. The Bible references fasting throughout in your spiritual guide. I will list a whole list of passages because people fasted for different kinds of situations throughout the Bible. Single people fasted for a mate. When people were in trouble, they fasted for relief from the trouble. All kinds of scenario called for it. But it was a time where they would set aside the physical in order to gain something more important than the spiritual. Fasting can be defined as the deliberate abstinence from some form of physical gratification for a period of time in order to activate a greater spiritual goal or to achieve a greater spiritual goal. Zechariah 7 verses 5 and 6 says, you fast for God, you eat for yourself. We eat for our physical well-being, for our nutritional value. But he says, when you fast, when you intentionally give up the physical to gain the spiritual, you do that for God. And so Jesus made the point that in my absence, after my death, resurrection, and ascension, you will fast until I come again. Because if you need something to happen in the physical, you're going to need to have a sharpened axe in the spiritual. And that sharpened axe is when you add fasting to prayer. I was speaking to a group uh, here recently and when I spoke to the group, a mother had a baby in her arms. And the baby broke the meeting up. Because the baby started crying and just creating all kind of distractions in the meeting. So I'm trying to speak to this group. They're distracted. I'm distracted. The baby was hungry. The baby wanted food, and the baby was hungry and desperate. It's bad enough if the baby is hungry. But if a baby's hungry and desperate, the baby will turn the place out. <laughs> the mother, recognizing that there was a big disturbance, tried to pacify the baby. She went in and brought out a, a pacifier. That's called fake food. A pacifier is designed to shut you up while not benefiting you at all. A pacifier is fake news. A pacifier is designed to make you think something is happening because you're performing the duty. You are sucking and sucking and sucking and sucking. So maybe if you suck hard enough and long enough, you think something is happening in your life. A lot of fake fasting goes on where you can go through the motions to pacify and make you think you are spiritual, make you think you're going. There's a lot of pacifying worship that goes on. Because I went to church, I must be spiritual or getting close to God. Well, the way you know you've been pacified is you're still hungry after you've done the work. God wants us to be hungry, but he wants us to be hungry for him. He wants there to be a hunger for God. And so Isaiah writes, and the people had a question, verse 3, verse 3 of Psalm, I mean Isaiah 58, why have we fasted and you do not see? 
Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire. In other words, we come to you, we tell you what we want, we tell you what we need, we give you our desires, and we don't hear a thing. So we've done the duty. We, we've, we've done what you've asked us to do. We fulfill what you've required, but heaven is not responding. Heaven is not answering us. Fasting is supposed to say that the spiritual is more important than the physical. That the supernatural is more important than the natural. Fasting says that man does not live by bread alone. That the physical can't fix this. Fasting says I need a spiritual booster. Because the vaccine of my normal worship isn't working. It is to declare that I need heaven more than I need earth. And to let you know, God, how serious I am, I'm going to let something on earth go for a period of time because I need something more important from heaven. And so it's designed to place the spiritual in front of the physical. Of course, Satan wants to flip the script. He wants to make the physical more important than the spiritual. Because if he can keep you physical then he can push back spiritual, which gives you limited access to heaven while increased access to earth. But since earth is not sufficient, then you find yourself limited in what you are able to achieve from a spiritual perspective. And so they were calling on God. They were going through the motions. They were doing the routine. And the question is raised at the beginning of verse 5, is it a fast like this? which I choose. Mm. Not the one you want, but the one I choose. In other words, you giving it your own definition. You've come about, you doing this your way and not the way that I demand, expect, and require. This leads him to an instruction for us and for those of you who will enter into this concept of making this a part of your spiritual discipline with a day a week or a portion of a day a week to deal with the deep issues of life and of family that and you know you need fasting because earth was not able to solve it. And so he gives them a baseball outline. Now in baseball, they are, there's the first base, the second base, and the third base, and the goal is home plate. Because when you hit home plate, you score. So the idea is to be able to round the basis of fasting so that when you have completed it, you have scored heaven invading history. Amen. So first base, the place that you go first in the fast that he chooses, continuing in verse 5, is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed, will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? So the first thing you've got to do to have an acceptable time, an acceptable concentrated prayer time that includes giving up the physical for the spiritual because you need heaven on earth is spiritually humbling ourselves before God. He calls it humble yourself, sackcloth and ashes, which is the posture of repentance. In other words, he says, if you want my attention from heaven, you must be willing to address sin in your life. Amen. Sackcloth and ashes, humbling yourself. In other words, you cannot use religious activity as a camouflage for unrighteous activity. We must face our sin if we want to see God's solutions. If we are not willing to face our sins, not excuse them, but face them to acknowledge God. The Bible says that the one, Psalm 66, 18, who harbors wickedness in his heart will not hear from God. So if you want to hear from God, you must 
face unrighteousness in your life or my life or collectively in our lives. We must not call it a mistake, a bad habit, or, you know, my bad. We've got to call it what God calls it if God has called it. And God calls it sin when we disobey him or his word. And so you must face it, humble yourself, sackcloth and ashes. It is the posture of repentance. And he says, this is the uh, a day that I approve of, that I accept. There are probably some people in here who avoid the scale. If someone were to ask you, have you stepped on the scale lately? You would, you would say no. And there are other people who will step on it and lean. <laughs> One reason that people don't step on it or step on it and lean is they don't want to face the truth. They, they, don't want to, they don't want it to be revealed that you've returned to meat <laughs> and dessert. You don't want it revealed that the scale is going up and not going down, thinking that somehow not getting on the scale is changing something. That leaning on it causing it to lie has changed something. It is an unwillingness to face the reality that keeps us from not benefiting. You must be willing to tell the doctor what's wrong if you want the doctor to make it right. You and I must be willing to tell God what's wrong with our attitudes, our actions, what we did, what we said, that would block fellowship with him if we want to hear from heaven, according to Psalm 66, 18. So, you know, when you want to remodel something, you got to be willing to tear stuff out. And it's messy before you can put new stuff in. And a lot of us want God to remodel our circumstances when we don't want him to tear out our sins. And if he's not free to tear out our unrighteousness, he's not free to remodel our lives and put them in the order that we want them to be in, need them to be in, and request that they be in. Many of us have had colonoscopies. That's not a fun situation. Colonoscopy is not one of those exams you look forward to. But until the doctor can get rid of the junk, he can't see or she can't see and remove the polyps that can produce the cancer. And so even though it is an uncomfortable process and an uncomfortable exam, it's necessary to have a healthy colon and to live a cancer-free life from the colon perspective. God is inviting us to spiritual colonoscopies. He's saying, I want to cleanse of sin so that I am free to produce what you need in your life through the fast which I choose. Not the one that you want, but the one that I choose. 